thanks very much, everyone, for coming. Thanks very much, Nathan, for uh, organising this this uh, workshop, which I think is going to be very useful for me. Uh, as Nathan said, I'm the PI of an of a ERC-funded project, the Hatha Yoga Project, which is looking at the history of physical yoga practice. It's a five-year project, and we're just, just past two years into it. So I think we're probably kind of, I hope, slightly over the, the top of the hill of data collection. We've collected a hell of a lot of data, um, and I'll talk about that, of course. What I, would, what I say at the beginning is I'm very much an end user. Um, I'm, you know, I'm the sort of person that uh, if I, I never look under the, the bonnet of my car unless it goes wrong. You know, I don't like to tinker around with things. I'm not, you know, not going to be creating new systems for uh, looking at the data. Um, I just, I'm, I'm an end user. So I was sort of half disappointed and half relieved to see that Mundana and Helen... Oh, are they Mundana's here now? Oh dear, okay. <laughs> because... Yes. Because I know that some of our practices are probably not, uh, not as, they, as they should be, so I'm very much open to uh, <laughs> advice and uh, correction in some way. But I, so I'll, I'm just going to talk you through what we've been doing. Um, yeah, well, just uh, go back to the point I make about being an end user. So actually I had a meeting with a PhD student yesterday who's just starting out, and so she's doing a you know, wonderful <laughs> bibliographic database in Zotero which looks great to me, but, you know, I'm, whatever, 20, 25 years down the line, I've got a really unwieldy text file of bibliographic stuff, and I'm happy with that. I'm not going to go back and re-enter everything into Zotero. You know, that's the that's sort of point I'm going to make. I'm, I want everything to be as efficient as possible uh, without me having to go and, you know, uh, do huge amounts of manual processing of data. Um, okay, so I will move on. What's, oh, gosh. Updates ready to install. That's not what I want. Cancel. Here we go. Okay, so very simple. The, it's a, the project is really quite simple, especially you know, if you look at it compared to Beyond Boundaries. We've got uh, primary outputs, 10 critical editions of Sanskrit texts on yoga, ranging from about the 11th century to the 19th century. Four monographs, and as I say, umpteen articles. I can't remember. There's probably about 20 uh, journal articles we're going to be producing by the end of it. And our data for producing those primary outputs uh, is, the, so the primary data categories are scans of manuscripts and published editions, okay? So we've got one of the project team members has spent probably most of the last two years in India going around manuscript libraries collecting scans where he can. Uh, and also, of course, there are lots of, you know, some of the, some of the texts we're working on have been edited in some way, so we uh, we try and track down some of the editions are very obscure, but we track them down and we use scans of those as well. Uh, and then, the, so the two primary methods in the project proposal are philology, so the editing of these, uh, these, these texts, and ethnography. So we've got one full-time ethnographer on the project as well. Sorry. And uh, she, yeah, she spent probably half, you know, already over a year in India, uh, searching out traditional yoga practitioners, uh, interviewing them, taking photographs, uh, filming them, and so forth. So she, she produces that ethnographic data. And then uh, a sort of, we didn't flag it up quite so much in the project proposal, but a pretty key part of our work as well, a key source of information are uh, historical, um, art historical materials that depict yoga practice. And I will, I'll talk a bit more about all these categories in a minute. Now, where I think, well, at the moment, the way we store this, this data is fairly unsystematically. We're not, you know, tagging it with loads of metadata and so forth. I think Daniela is a bit with her ethnographic stuff, but probably not to the degree that would uh, meet the usual requirements. At the moment, we've got a shared Google Drive folder, and then everything comes down to our personal laptops, and then we all back that up on external hard drives. And that's it at the moment. Um, but I will talk about the, the plans for the future now, um, so yeah, looking at the, the uh, philological side of the, the project, the text data processing. So the process of that is we get our, all the witnesses we can of a text. Well, we start before we've got all the witnesses, but it's an ongoing process, and collate those uh, witnesses, those manuscripts. Now, in the project proposal, I did uh, put some fancy stuff in about 
cladistics. Does anyone know about cladistical stemma analysis? But to be honest, since I've looked into it since the proposal, I've become more and more sceptical about cladistical analysis, and I don't think we're going to use it at all. There are various problems with it. Um, not least, it's, so it's, what it is, it's a way of forming a stemma of a manuscript tradition modelled on uh, genetic analysis. And one of the problems is that you can only fork in two ways. You can only have a bifurcation. You can't have a trifurcation. And of course, you know, we all know that one manuscript might get copied by more than two scribes. So instantly breaks down there. And it also can't take into account contamination between branches of a stemma. So you know, that, this is one of the examples of things where th there's a bit of a fashion in Indology at the moment. You know, certain people are really promoting this, but I'm, I'm extremely sceptical about it. And I think actually what would be very beneficial would be a project looking at exactly that and seeing whether it do is helpful or not. Because I don't think anyone's... It, people don't seem to be questioning it. That seems to be a problem with some some of the digital tools available, people just think, oh, great, digital humanities, here's a new digital tool, let's go for it. And I think we need to be a little bit sceptical. Um, again, for collation, there are, there, are collation, there are tools for collating large uh, bodies of witnesses and so forth. And in fact, when I started my PhD in 1995, I was urged to use this new program, Collate, that was being uh, developed in Oxford. But again, I think that it actually costs me a lot of time doing that. You have to go, you, first of all, you have to read the manuscript and you have to transcribe it and then you have to break it up into little chunks that can then be compared. <coughs> and I honestly think it, it, yeah, it probably wasted months of my time doing that and I wouldn't do that again. Um, and then there's, so after you've collated your witnesses, there's the editing process. Now, fortunately, uh, well, especially since I've discounted stomatic analysis, again, with our text, we always have contamination. So you can't do rigid mechanical stomatic, stomatic analysis. So the editing really is a, we need to do it. You know, I don't think, it's, I don't think any digital tools yet have been developed in any way that, can, that would be able to perform the editing job on, on our, our text. And then finally, once we've uh, collated and edited, we want to produce the edition for publication. Now, what we're going to do with, with our project is every edition we're going to, uh, we, we're going to produce finally in, uh, so in XML and the TEI encoding that's been developed specially for the SARIT project. Um, now, again, in the project proposal, I got all excited and wrote, you know, there's a sort of, it seemed like it would be practicable at the time, whereby from the XML uh, SARIT file, you could then process it two ways. You could either go, you know, just at the touch of a button, it could be converted into LaTeX and then a PDF, so book publishing form, or the other way into uh, HTML. And I think I've got some pictures for those of you who... So here's, Sarat. here's an example of a Sarat file. You can't see, but anyway, Sarat's a website. It's got um, not a huge number of texts yet. I mean, that's one of the problem of these things is there's only a small body of text. So actually, I don't think many endologists are using it as a search tool, but it's very good for presenting a single text, and also we know it's sustainable, you know, it's funded, it's got, just got a new round of funding from Heidelberg and so forth, so those texts are going to be there for a, a long time. Uh, there's a, you know, a, 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 an output file, a PDF produced by LaTeX of a critical edition, and then there are these fancy, various, uh, very impressive um, HTML outputs you can get. This, is, this was developed by Charles Lee, who's at Cambridge. Uh, this is a very nice uh, front end, you can see it's saptomiver.org where you can alter all the parameters of which manuscripts you're looking at and so forth, and it will generate an addition and an apparatus. Uh, and this is a, another one. I was hoping to be able to go live onto the internet, but I don't think I would attempt to do that now. But Andrew Ollett developed this one, whereby, again, from an XML file, you can wave your mouse over these highlighted bits of the edited text, and the variants will pop up by magic. Um, so these are, you know, this is... This is this is what I think we, you know, we, what we want to do is we want to make our editions, we want people to read our critical editions, and this seems to be a very good format to encourage people to look at the, the variants. Um, now, okay, so what have we got next there? Uh, yes, yeah, so and one of the things we've been talking about, we talked about yesterday, was, was documenting the process of our research, of working with this data and whether we need to do that, whether we need to make that available. And I was kind of reminded of this, I was thinking about this just a couple of days ago when a friend posted this on Facebook. It's one of Daniel Ingalls' notebooks. He's been going through some 
Harvard archives, you know, trying to uh, understand how the great scholar Ingalls produced um, various of his, of his works. Now, I think it would be somewhat sort of hubristic to assume that people might want to do the same with, uh, with, with our work. Um, and also, well, I mean, this is something I, I, maybe we could raise in the discussion. I'm not going to go uh, too much further into it, but I don't really see how we're going to, you know, how one would be able to record the process of editing. And I'm not sure it's particularly useful. I think it's hard, as I say, it's hard enough to get people to read critical editions um, in the first place, let alone go through the mechanics of how they were made. I will, one little aside, there's, there's one moment, one, I was talking about this a few months ago with some colleagues, when one's editing a text, there's one moment I think would, would be nice to record, and I haven't worked out a way of doing it, of when you know, you've, you've, got a, you've collated a few manuscripts, a bit of the text doesn't make sense, so you come up with a brilliant emendation and you, you record it in your critical edition, and then you collate another manuscript, and there it is, you know, your emendation is now recorded in a manuscript, and you think, yes, you know, I was right. But then there's that sinking feeling when you realise that now, in the edition, you're just going to be, be recording that witness and not your brilliant <laughs> emendation anymore. So that would be one, one interesting thing to go back for. There should be some sort of German word for it, I think, for that feeling. <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay, so that is... How am I doing? I'm going to move on. Um, now, also with all our data, so prime, our primary uh, source of data is uh, manuscript sources, and I know we're meant to make everything available, particularly with these ERC-funded projects, but the thought of trying to get permission from all Indian libraries to actually make, one, even one, once you've got the scans, to then be allowed to put them online and make them publicly available just, just you know, fills me with absolute horror. And this, I got this email yesterday from Jason, who's, who's the one in India at the moment going around the libraries. This just to give you an example. We went to the Sanskrit College's library today only to learn that the uncle of the librarian had died that morning, and the librarian had gone to a village some distance from Cochin to be with her family. We met the principal, and she was very nice. She said, the librarian is the custodian of the library, and she's the only one with the key. What can I do? You must come back on Wednesday. You know, so just... Just getting it, just seeing the manuscripts is often, you know, a triumph, and then getting permission to scan them. But getting permission to make them public, I think, is, you know, that would be a whole another five-year project, probably for each library in itself. So that's not something we're considering. Well, I was also relieved to see this is also the hot, hot off the press, just two or three days ago. It's not only us; it's not only foreign scholars. Even Baba Ramdev, you know, who's tight with the government, um, He's a sort of Ayurveda yoga guru, stroke businessman, entrepreneur. Even he's having trouble getting hold of manuscripts from the government repository in, in Delhi. So, uh, yes, you know, we have, this, is a, this is a problem in our work and uh, pretty insurmountable, I think. It's not getting any easier, put it that way. Um, okay, so that's the textual data. Now, I'm aware, I've got until the hour, haven't I? That's your time. Um, good. Uh, so now I'm going to look at art historical data. Just I'll just give you an example, basically. I'll give you some examples of the stuff we work with and what we might do with uh, these the, the, the photographs and scans that we have. So this is probably the sort of the most exciting discovery we've made so far. This was last year. We were I and Daniela uh, came to this gate. On the, I just seen one passing note in a in a Hindi article about it, and there were some meant to be some statues of some famous yogis at the bottom. But then, uh, and it happened to be on our route, it's this rather obscure little town in Gujarat, and then we noticed when we were looking at the, the, the famous yogis who are sort of here in relief, and then up in here all these uh, yogis doing complex yoga postures. And this, this makes them the oldest such uh, statues by about 300 years. So it's a very exciting discovery. We got some rather bad photographs at the time. Oh, you can't really see that at all, can you? Um, I don't know if... But anyway, I don't know if you can tell what's going on, but it's a... Well, actually, you can from this. Because we then went back and got some better photographs. That was a whole saga in itself. I went with Mark Singleton, who's a colleague, my colleague on the, on the project, uh, with the uh, Indian photographer. That's, that, again, is a, a worth a book in itself, the story of how we got these photographs. So I won't go into it now. Um, but again, I'm wondering, you know, do we need to <coughs> preserve the story of the different levels? You know, we got, we got about three or four sets of photographs of this gate getting better and better. Presumably, we just want to publish the, the best ones. Although, just to go back to this one, I don't know if you can make out now. It was quite handy having the pigeon on the top. I don't know if you can see it, because at least with that one, I can prove I haven't just turned the photograph <laughs> upside down. You know, it's not 
not someone sitting in lotus posture. Mm -hmm. um, now the other sort of sources we use, one in particular that I've worked with a lot uh, are Mughal miniatures of yogis. And what we found, particularly with the Mughal miniatures, incredibly, um, they're very, uh, what's the word? There's a no, realist, there's an art historical term, but they, you know, they really seem to depict uh, uh, real characters. And by analysing the insignia and the very fine details in these <coughs> miniatures, we can kind of, I've, I've used that to, uh, to map the history of, of yoga practices and also certain you know, sects of yogis. So here, now I'm showing this one because of, I've spent much too long um, looking at the position of earrings in yogis' ears. And you see here they're in the earlobes, and then there was an important shift a couple of hundred years later when the, the earrings move into the cartilages. Now this is a very sort of specific minor example, but what the, um, the point is this is a very useful, a very useful tool for analysing the, the, the history. In fact, nice to see Dowood at the back, actually, whose work I think I reference when I'm going on about... Uh, uh, earrings, um, but these these images are a very useful tool. But I, you know, I've got thousands of them on my computer, completely disorganised. Um, now they also, in tandem with ethnographic images, so here, here's a photograph of a, a yogi I took at Kumbh Mela uh, in was the date there, 2013, uh, and then we can compare that. Actually, this is an image from the same album as the previous image I showed, so we know this is a sort of ancient ascetic yoga practice. Uh, meanwhile, um, the same yogi of today is doing things like this, which we have no, uh, no precedence for, and in fact seems to be derived from Western modern yoga traditions. So what, but what, what I want to do with all these images, and it's not written into the project, but I've just put in a proposal to the Wellcome Institute, and we might, um, hopefully that might come through, but I'm determined to make this happen. I've got a part-time PhD student who's all ready to use the other half of her time to input, to create a big database of, of yoga images. So it'd be something, you know, we're not sure where we're going to host it, that's all, you know, depends if, if we get the funding and so forth, but uh, that is something I can really see the use of, that if we tag all these images with metadata, both historical, modern images, you know, we can say lotus position in the 17th century by a female yogini, and we can bring up all the pictures of that, and then it, that would be extremely useful for um, for, for tracing tracing the, the the history of yoga, so that's uh, yeah that's what I plan. That's what I, that's in a dream world. What will happen with all the the uh, photographic the Im image data that we've got as, as part of the project, um, and that is it. I think that's all I was going to say about our data. I'm, as I said, I'm open for uh, you know throw tomatoes at me, rotten eggs. I'm worried that we might be doing something very wrong. But we're in a, we're in the perfect position now. We're as I said, we're two years in. We've amassed a lot of data. I think we've as I, I think we're over the the hill of, of uh, manuscript scan acquisition. So now is a now is a good time to be um, planning for what we're going to do with all that data um, and how we store it and how we present it and so forth. Okay. Thank you for paying attention. <laughs> my prerogative here and uh, ask the question and make comments or the comment. Jeff will tell you that if you have filmed a manuscript it's, and it's pre-modern, there's no legal issues with sharing. It may be extremely rude to the owner of the <laughs> document. Okay. But that's Legally, it's okay, but the pro what, what worries me is that then may jeopardize future scholars yeah. going to get yes. scans yes. of yes. other manuscripts. Yes. Then I'll also point out that <clears throat> On Zenodo, you can have an embargo period. So you could upload all of those and say, make this open access in 50 years. And now, whether or not you believe that will work in terms of will it what, still be around, yeah. what the world will be like 50 years from now is another question. But it might be worth thinking about, particularly in terms of compliance uh, questions, right? Like with the ELC. With the ELC, yeah. Uh, is it how, so is, it's absolutely, they're adamant that you have to make all data available, publicly that's available. That's maybe a different discussion. Yeah. Um, but if you did want to make data publicly available that, without offending people in India, you could mm. embargo it with a long embargo. Um, and then my question is about uh, your metadata. So for instance, you have 
you have pictures from Google Books and pictures of the you took in the Kuma Mail and what, how are you keeping track of like who took this when, where, uh, what, what library holds this miniature that I took a picture of? Those Completely things. haphazardly, to be honest. That's why I say that's why that's why I think because people send me images all the time. I haven't got time to you know input metadata for all of them. Uh, I mean, I suppose the, my photographs and Daniela's Daniela does give good metadata with you know stores keeps good metadata with her photographs. So that's probably a different thing. The ethnographic thing is is better. But the the, the historical um, images one can with time and effort track down where they've come from and create that metadata. I don't think it's going to be lost and perhaps not where it was scanned and that kind of thing. But uh, yes, that's why I think it'd be great to have this project of an online you know, yoga image archive or something. Okay, now other people can do it. <laughs> yeah, you already asked my metadata question, but uh, the second part of my question is about data sharing. So you say you have everything in Google Drive and your mm. team. <laughs> And do people work with each other's data? And how do you know what is what? <laughs> and um, especially all this precious uh, information that, that you have and that you haven't recorded anywhere. That well, we have, I suppose. Yeah, we do all use it. We can all access, I mean, all the, mm -hmm. each, so yeah, there's a folder for every text that we're working on, and then all its manuscripts in subfolders, and mm -hmm. there'll be scans within those, <coughs> so we can all access them quite happily. Um, yeah, Dani all Daniela's photographs, she's the ethnographer, they're all available to us. And we have files of, you know, rare books, whatever that's it. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, it's all, I mean, I was quite, uh, what was the, someone mentioned something yesterday, I made an overleaf, that looks quite useful. Because at the moment, as I said, we've, we've got enough work to keep everyone busy individually. So we're not sort of, at the same time, we're not working on the same text. Um, we did try, what was that program we used before? Sub-Ether Edit. Sub-Ether Edit, and that was a way of, of collaborating, you know, working on text files at the same time. So if everyone's online, then everyone can edit the same document. But we, <coughs> we had lots of pr problems with that. It often didn't work, and after all, we just gave up, and now we're back to the old, you know, you work on it, and then tell me when you're finished, and send me an email, and then I'll work on it. Um, but if this, I might have to overleaf and see if that works. Um, I, I suppose two, two questions. Uh, one of them is I can understand how it's very. I don't wish to be sort of press you on this point in a way that suggests I'm doing that it's wrong. But Probably. I can understand why it's very difficult to go back and ask a whole bunch of Indian institutions anything. Um, but there seems to be a due diligence element. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of effort involved in saying, would you be okay with us uploading this for, a, for public use mm. at the moment where you're in there yes. and are making the scans? That's true. And the kind, that kind of due diligence of, I'm going to do things with the thing you've given me access to as a result of you, maybe, I have a due diligence to actually tell you what I'm going to do and make sure you're okay with it. Mm, well, normally you have to, often you have to sign something, don't you, saying that you will give them any publication that you've used it in. Yes. And whether that I also says you won't reproduce it. to imagine all the things you might do is not necessarily permission. Um, you know, I, I wonder if you have a due diligence to say, look, this is what we plan to do with it. Are there any of these things that you might have an issue with? Mm. Right. Um, so I, I, I just wonder about that particular. Yeah. Kind of. I mean, yeah. We, now, now you mentioned. I was sort of thinking you could also just sort of, after you've got the data, then email and ask permission and say because they never respond to emails. You can say, well, I asked. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you can say if you don't respond to this, I'll take that as a yes. Well, that's but, I mean, it's legally the case as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yes, you're right. We should. We, we could just make that part. I mean, maybe I should say it to Jason. Look, from now on, at point of receipt, because you don't want to jeopardise it until you've actually got hold of the things as well. They might go, oh, hang on, you know, if you ask beforehand. 
and normally they'll have, you know, normally it's they make you wait for days and you tell them you've got to fly home the next, you know, that evening and you'll get it at six o'clock just as you've got to get in your taxi. So, case of grabbing it and running. Um, but yeah, I'll, I will suggest that to Jason. That's a good idea. And I just, um, I, Luke's just walked in actually. I wanted to mention, it's, it's, there's obviously a lot of variation between uh, libraries and in particular the big chain libraries are well known for being extremely hospitable and helpful and you know they'll put you up for free and feed you and and give you scans for free and so um, I don't know what they I expect their policy they expect they would be fine about uploading the data online as well May I? please yeah I I, I wonder, we, um, you and I have talked, and it's on your website, the connection between um, the actual asanas and descriptions in text. And I wonder, um, it seems to me like that would be, obviously, given what you said about under the bond and things, not something for you to do, but it would be wonderful to have um, a description in the text which somehow links to a visualization mm. of a particular, right, you're reading now you put your left leg behind your head and raise Absolutely. yourself on your pinky, I don't know. And then there's a picture, either historical picture or a contemporary picture or both, which says, look, this is this awesome. Yeah, I yeah, know, we've, 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 we've done that. In fact, Mark's much more involved than I was in a film. We just made a film of the latest, the sort of most recent of the text we're editing, which has 110 postures, is it? 112. Yeah. 112. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've had you know models in to do those 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 poses, so that's all been filmed. There, I think some of them have proved impossible, even for England's bendiest yogis. So we may have to go to <laughs> in Indian school children is looking like the next 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 point of call. Um, also, yeah, part of the problem is that you really don't know often what's being described. The description can be quite, quite terse or quite abstruse, mm -hmm. and so to to put a picture next to it might be a little bit misleading and yes. you know, we just can't figure out what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Mandana? I think, I mean, like, I, this is just such an amazing project. I mean, the content and the stuff you're bringing together, but I think that one of the most important lesson also for people, for funders, but also for people that apply, is that the amount of work it takes to make this digitally available is totally underestimated mm. left and right. Frederica is just finishing a huge project, the Crossroads project, and because she had a, I'm just saying that, she had worked in this realm before, she under, she know, know, knew exactly how to manage her five PhD students and postdocs, and well, wow. yeah, <laughs> but the, I think, and this is something when we see grant, so I read a lot of grant applications because they have double heads, hats, heads, um, <laughs> see, I'm not a native speaker. Is that the amount of work it takes to constantly input the metadata and to manage the materials and to systematically file them and to sort them and to order them is so much work that in principle every project should have someone that does this work if you're working on the scale that you are working on, right? Where it's not one person. And we know from the Endangered Languages Documentation Project, the PhD students goes in trained qualitatively, they start, they collect a shitload of data and at day three they forget what they were recording and what they were talking about because they think they can keep it in their minds, right? And they can't. And then they come to the end of their, their three years PhD thing, they have to submit a documentary corpus to us and they have to finish their dissertation, write some articles, get a job. <laughs> but I think it's really key to understand that we always think the digital is easy. No, it's not. It's so much work. And yeah. We underestimate this. And in the end, you know, the researchers go into, well, we can't manage this, so we're not going to do this. And then my question comes, what happens if you get hit by a bus when you walk out the street now with all this material on your Google Drive? Well, Google has it. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With no metadata there, yeah. Or not, well, some uh, we, of it we does. Have to, um, yeah. We have to move on. Although I, I, I will say that when you were talking about how difficult something was, that it was faster to do the old fashioned way. When I, I started on my project with Matis, he said writing an etymological dictionary the old fashioned way would be much, much faster yeah. than doing it this way. Yeah, mm. exactly. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> we ha well, so I saw other benefits in doing it the fancy computer way in terms of uh, methodological explicitness. Um, there also might be things about like whether you're not get hit by buzz. But I, I do mm -hmm. think that you're, you're right to ask kind of 
what are these computers giving me? And if someone tells you it's saving you time, they're lying. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. okay, so 